A nefarious nightmare contains themes that may be explicit or triggering for some. Specific warnings and disclaimers will be mentioned in the show notes. A nefarious nightmare assumes all parties that are mentioned in these cases to be innocent unless proven guilty in a court of law. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to Season 4. The laws seem to protect the offenders and not the victim. After about a year, um, I had to take a step back. I had to go to meetings and therapy and group therapy and homicide survivor groups and 12-step programs. And I mean, I I had to, to save my own life. I had kids that counted on me. They were only three and one at the time that this, that this happened. Two and four, really, as the time was moving on, was just like really when I was in the grips of things. But if, if nothing else comes from this podcast, but somebody else being being helped or getting some hope um in keeping my mom's story alive too but it's possible to like get over that hill and i feel like i i'm living proof of that because there are so many days where i feel like my life could have gone a lot differently but i did the work to get through that and there were so many times i wanted to give up you know, and, and, and not, and let the rage consume me and let, you know, the sadness consume me. I do want to, I want my mom's story to stay alive because if I stop telling the story, it will disappear. The, the investigation will, will disappear and it, it will no longer be even talked about. I mean, people, you know, it would just go away. And, and I don't want that to happen. I want law enforcement to know that I'm still here and I'm still pushing for this and I still want them to do something about this. This case is a bit different than what we normally cover, as it's the case of a daughter who lost their mother to murder. It's widely speculated that the murderer had a financial motive involving property owned by the family. This case also brings light to something that we have discussed in our podcast quite frequently, how law enforcement, more often than not will fail a family, how favoritism is shown with law enforcement. They have to protect their own, you know, and how offenders, assailants, and murderers tend to be remembered as quote-unquote good people, while victims and survivors are overlooked. With that, I'm Amanda Cronin. And I'm Courtney Fenner, and A Nefarious Nightmare presents A Motive of a State, Justice for Lori Lynn. There is something to be said about all the family members of the victims and survivors that we cover in this podcast. Each and every one of them share something in common and true empathy. Because we have no choice but to know what it's like to lose a loved one, they all respond and react, even mourn in similar and also different ways. But the tenacity and pure heart is what they share. There is something unique though. If you are the daughter or son of a parent that's murdered, if, for example, you've listened to our two-part series on Kimberla Jo Lair, or if you've ever followed up about the case of Betsy Faria, who sadly was murdered, and where her daughter, Mo Day, has been an intense voice for all surviving family members who have not only been overlooked or treated poorly by either law enforcement or media, but also have seen time and time again sensationalism surrounding their cases which do nothing more than damage the reputation or even hurt a case if it's ongoing. It's a unique perspective because many times we see cases where a parent loses a child or a spouse loses their significant other or even a sibling losing another sibling. But when is it a daughter or son? There's an inner child that just wants to ask for their lost parent what to do and how to feel in that moment, how to mourn. Imagine being in that position suddenly losing your parent and even the facts aren't lining up in front of you you still wonder why you wake up every day to greet your parent in some way or go to them for advice only to remember that their life was taken from you additionally imagine losing your mom or your dad and having no choice but to wake up and see their face plastered on newspapers or news stations everywhere 
and you're screaming from within things like, nobody asked my permission, or no, those facts aren't right. You're also wondering why they are saying certain things about your parent that you know to be complete opposite of what you have come to know. You're hurt because while you're scraping up every single dime that you can cover the cost of living or burial expenses or anything to that degree, the media that is in your face is clearly using it to get a paycheck. There are so many factors to this that I can't even begin to explain here. But essentially, you begin to get into that orphaned mindset and despite having the best education on what happened, you are still left unsure, confused, hurt, lost, and even broken at times. Yes, losing a family member or loved one is always terrible and horrific, but it's a unique feeling when it's your parent. No matter how grown you are, how well established, it's always hard losing a parent, but especially if it's at the hands of a murderer. As we mentioned earlier, this case is a bit different than what we normally talk about, but important because this case is of a loving daughter seeking justice for what happened to her mother and likely at the hands of a family member. It is believed that the perpetrator had a motive involving an estate owned by the family. We will touch up on how law enforcement may have failed them as a family and how she has fought tirelessly to seek justice and closure, as well as processing this entire thing. Losing a parent is never a fun and celebratory thing, but imagine having them there with you one minute, gone the next, unexpected like poof, vanished, because someone got greedy. Once again, we aren't assuming anything because this case is still ongoing, but please listen to Sammy Lynn, Lori Lynn's daughter, tell all about what happened and you be the judge of what you think happened to Lori Lynn. My name is Samantha Lynn and I am from Youngstown, Ohio. I currently live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I have two children who I adore. Um, I am softball coach, soccer coach. Um, I do those sorts of things. My husband does the same. He's coaching. Uh, so we spend a lot of time on the, on the baseball fields and the soccer fields. Uh, but other than that, we love to travel. We always travel together. We always make it a point to vacation. I just spend time with family. Um, health and fitness is, is a big one. And uh, therapeutic wellness is, is a big thing too in our lives. The victim we're going to be talking about today is my mother. Her name is Lorraine Lynn, um, born and raised in Youngstown, Ohio. I was 31 years old and she was 60 years old. The date that this happened was August 1st, 2017. This event took place on my grandmother's property, which is where my mom grew up in Girard, Ohio. I don't know really where to start because I could go all the way back to my childhood, honestly. But there has always been tension with my mom and her siblings. She has four siblings and uh, there has always been, been tension between them regarding financial things. My grandma and grandpa, they built a farmhouse and they have about 30 some acres of land uh, on the north side of Youngstown, Ohio. And my parents built um, on this land and other relatives have built on this land as well. Um, but there has always been a feud um, and it really started ramping up when my grandfather passed away in 2016 and my grandma started getting dementia. So there was a lot of things that happened in those moments where uh, my mom had been trying to preserve my grandmother's assets and her funds and her savings accounts and her she owns a whole bunch of rental properties so um, they were all in my, my grandpa's name so she was getting them switched over from my grandpa's name to her name and this caused a lot of friction in the family um, because there there are there were certain siblings or one in particular um, that did not want um, my grandfather's name to be off of, of, of the rentals, off of the accounts. Um, and we didn't realize this. Um, my mom, I think, did 
uh, but this person was pretty much siphoning money from the estate um, and abusing abusing the power that they had over my grandma because my grandma was slowly going into a deeper dementia when my grand when my grandpa passed away. So that's really what led up to it. Um, we we have other me and my sister. Uh, it's just me and her, and we have had other experiences with my mom's side of the family and um, we have succumbed to abuse in our childhood. Uh, I remember being about 10 years old and um, all of our little friends, all we had to do was walk through the woods. You know, I feel like I was the last generation to like get out there and run through the woods all day and go to my friends' houses and just, you know, play in the woods. Um, and that's exactly what I was doing on one particular day. And, uh, I, um, was stopped in the middle of the woods by two other neighborhood boys who decided to beat me up, um, in the middle of the woods. And I ran home crying and, you know, I didn't realize this again until later in life because my parents did try to protect me from some of this, um, that, these boys were paid by a particular sibling of my mom uh, to beat me up. They were paid and they were paid in ice cream. <laughs> so there were things, you know, my sister was hung by her ankles um, and dropped into thorn bushes. Um, uh, just very subtle little things that were um, very abusive and just really sign of like control trying to control us or um a sense of um intimidation uh, i think was a big one so that that's kind of like a side story a side a backstory and and you know there's a lot more that goes into that but again i think the the big thing that big red flags that started were right after my grandfather passed away um and and my mom was trying to help my grandma handle the estate basically my mom and i and and my sister too my sister and my mother uh, we were all really close we um my parents had a divorce in 2003 or 2002 and it was rough for a couple years there but as we all became adults all of us um we just enjoyed each other's company so much. Like even my mom and her new boyfriend and my dad and his new girlfriend, we'd all all spend Christmases together, Thanksgiving, Easter, like we would still spend holidays together. And regardless of whatever happened between them, everybody was friendly, Um, which, which was amazing, especially now, you know, when I have my kids and stuff like that. So we always had a close relationship. My mom, had built a house uh, near Ravenna, Ohio, which is near Akron. And she would drive from Akron to Pittsburgh at least once a week, maybe twice to, to come and spend time with my kids and babysit my kids. So I could, you know, and then she'd have them over her house for a weekend. And I mean, she was very, a very active Nana. After my grandfather passed away, there was a moment where Uh, my mom and some of the siblings were trying to rekindle their relationship. And I I think that at this moment, this is when my mom was most vulnerable because she just lost her dad and she was grieving her dad. And this, this sibling took advantage of that. Um, And uh, he tried to... (sighs) get on my mom's good side and I me and my sister because of what happened to us as children we never ever ever wanted to be around him ever um or his wife him or his wife I we wanted nothing to do with them it was it was hard for us um and that's a big reason why we moved out of the city um is to start anew and not have to be around that kind of family dynamic but Um, I was over my grandma's house and my mom was there and she asked me to bring the kids over. And, um, this was a big event, not a big event, but it it was a, uh, 
big significance to me because when I brought my kids over, I noticed that his, this, her brother's wife was there. And this is the, you know, I, we want nothing to do with her. It was, it was torture growing up. And, um, and then he came over and I looked at my mom and this is the first time I feel like I had actually stood up to her a little bit um, as an adult. And I was very upset that she did not tell me that they were going to be there. And here I have both of my children there. And I wanted, I didn't want them ever, ever to have any contact with my kids. And um, she said, you know, people change, Sam. You've changed. And I said, yeah. Yeah. I have become an adult. I've, I've changed, but people who abuse animals at a young age, people who abuse children at a young age, uh, those people, those people don't change. There's something wrong. There's something wrong in their brain. There's something wrong with them. And I, the last thing I remember telling her is just to never trust a snake. And uh, I think her grief. Um, made her become vulnerable into into wanting she probably wanted a good relationship with her siblings she probably had good intentions but the other party did not legally i do not think that i can call them an offender um no charges have been pressed uh no conviction no charges um they are still actively investigating this um well, they're still in, there's the case is still open, actively investigating, not not quite sure. But I what I do know that I can say is that I personally 100 percent believe that her brother killed her. I will start with the phone call that I got um, August. It was actually August 2nd when I got the phone call. Um, four or five in the morning, something like that. A lot of my times get mixed up because so much has happened and it was so traumatic that day that I, there are moments where I feel like I have blocked them out. But this phone call, it was, it was still dark when I got this phone call and it was from my mom's fiance. And he said, your mom didn't come home last night. I, did she stay with you? And I said, no, she didn't stay with me. And he said, do you know, did she say anything? Did she contact you? Did she call you? And I said, no, I, you know, she usually we talk like every couple of days. And in that particular day, I hadn't heard from her. Um, so of course, immediately concerned because this is not like her. I mean, my mom, she, she worked construction her whole life. She was a, a, a morning person. She came home at four, she ate her dinner at five and she was in bed by nine. You know, I mean, every single night from the moment I was, I can remember as a child, that's, that's how it was. Um, never, ever did she not come home at all. So this was, this was pretty alarming. So of course I call my sister, I call my dad, um, because he's, he still lived on the property, um, that's connected by the land. So he lived by my mom's brother and he lived, um, by my grandma. They're all kind of connected by this by this farm and so I immediately call him um call my sister and then and I'm I'm basically telling them like you need to look for mom I mean I'm calling my mom's cell phone it's just ringing 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 um and it just immediately like panic starts to set in and um I call the cops um from Pittsburgh I called you know the Liberty Police Department the north side of Youngstown I I called their police department and basically begged them to do a welfare check because I said I I knew in my heart and in my head I knew something bad happened and I I felt I I felt it right then in my gut something wasn't right so I begged them you know to go over to my to my mom's brother's house go over to my dad's and go over to my grandma's and you need to look for my mom. Um, so at this point now I'm rushing home. Like I, I am on my way <clears throat> back to Youngstown. Um, and at this point it's daylight. Uh, and my dad goes over to my grandma's house. She's not there. Um, 
my uncle shows up. I don't even like calling him that, but I, for this purpose, I don't know what else to call him. Um, so he shows up too, which is interesting. Uh, I don't know why. Um, and they decided to, um, oh, I'm sorry. They looked back towards, so my, my grandma has this big farm, um, big farm barn. We had big like tractors and stuff like that, that was used to like mow the property. And, uh, my uncle looks back at the barn and he said, the tractor's missing. And they started to follow the path of the tractor. Um, sorry, let me back up. <laughs> I don't mean to do this to you, but my dad, while he was walking up around the property, noticed my mom's car. My mom's car was found on the far side of the barn where my grandfather used to burn scrap. So there was nails, there was glass, and this was a brand new 2017 Nissan Pathfinder, pristine condition. Um, brand new, like my mom just got it maybe six months prior to that. And uh, yeah, and she was parked on like all this gravel and construction debris. Um, so when they discovered the car was there, that's when my uncle looked over and said, the tractor's missing. So that, at that point, they follow the path of the tractor. The tractor only did one loop, comes back, and now we have two man-made ponds. These ponds are significant because they're man-made and they, my mom helped build them. And so did her brother um, and my grandpa. They built the house. They, I mean, they did everything on that property. So my mom knew that property like the back of her hand. She knew the ponds, everything. This tractor went one loop around. And when they walked around up to that, it was the second pond in the back back. And my uncle says to my father, now this is what my father is telling me. My, my uncle says to my father, oh, there's the tractor. But as soon as my dad looks, he said he didn't see the tractor. He saw legs, legs coming from. So they, my, my dad rushed over, obviously not knowing what happened or, or what was going on. If, if someone was dead or alive, you know, he realized, you know, he was like, it's your sister, it's your sister, like panicking. And, um, he found her. Uh, face down on top of a 1975 Ford farm tractor. Uh, the, the tractor was partially submerged in the pond and her, she was kind of draped over the steering wheel and her shoulders were in the water and her legs were on the back of the tractor sticking out of the pond. Um, at this moment, and this is what really gets me. And I wish if I would have been there, I would have loved to like actually hear this moment because my dad said, and this is what he told the police. He said, you know, it's your sister, it's your sister. He runs over there and tries it, tries to like, you know, see if she's alive. My uncle goes, don't touch anything. That's weird. I mean, that's your sister. Listen, <laughs> I don't care if, if that was me. I don't care if it was a dog. I would have ran over and been like, oh my God, oh my God, this dog, like our dog or whatever. Is it alive? Not him. Don't touch him. So first responders come. They go back. I'm trying to make sure I do this in chronological order, but again, if I backtrack, I'm sorry, but it's because some of my memory is a little bit spotty, obviously, because of, it's just so, it was such a tragedy and so traumatic that day. Um, I hadn't arrived yet. I was an hour and a half out from this, um, from Youngstown. I was an hour and a half out. So that's how long it takes me from Pittsburgh. So I, I'm, I'm rushing home. Um, my dad calls me and said that he found her. So, and at this point I am 
I probably shouldn't have been driving because I I was so <sighs> broken and heavy at this moment that I I don't even remember the drive honestly I really don't remember it I I, I remember crying and screaming and punching my ceiling and you know I mean every single it was just so pure and so raw and and so rage filled um because i knew i knew in my heart um that he had to be involved i just i just did and then as time progressed and we went on we had just found more and more and more evidence leading to, to that um she had no enemies none whatsoever so the police come the ambulance comes they don't call the coroner out to the scene. My uncle is the first one to greet the first responders. He um, is, he grew up with the chief of police and their, their sons played baseball together and all that kind of stuff. So they knew each other. So, so he goes to him and he said, I think it was an accident. It looked, that's what it looks like. Um, and he probably just took his word for it, you know, just thinking like, you know, why would he, do something like this you know so the police and the ambulance they didn't rope anything off they didn't you know crime scene tape anything they didn't even call the coroner out to the scene and this is huge and i didn't realize how huge this was until i got involved in like investigating this myself but there was a body that was in water and as a police officer you do not know if that body has water in its lungs or not. You don't know if that person drowned or if that person was deceased prior to going into the water. So in order for you to find that out, there's no way to do that unless you call the doctor, unless you call the coroner out to the scene and the, and the coroner can make that determination. You know, so, but these people know, they just, they just took her right away and when I, when I finally arrived, every first responder was gone. No one was there to talk to me. No one was there to tell me what was going on. And when I got there, we had a, there was a handful of family members. I remember standing on the porch. My dad took us back, me and my sister both, we took us back to, uh, to where he found her and, um, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So I turned around and I marched right up to the porch where everybody was sitting down and I knew I was just, I, and it, it's, it, this is on camera. <laughs> so I have since watched this and watched myself do this. So after my dad showed us where he found her, um, I, something, some small child inside of me, was so rage filled from everything that had happened in my past. I think that I just went right up to him on that porch and started giving him a piece of my mind. And I, I told him in front of the handful of family members that were there, I said, I know you did this. I know you killed my mom. I'm going to find out. And I started yelling out all of the, the abuse. I remember, um, from, from him as a child and watching him throw little barn kittens into fires and that I knew that he had killed our childhood dog, that he used to starve his own son. Like I, I just, all of these things I was just throwing out and, um, he did not get up once. And he basically was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking to everything, everything. He didn't even like raise an eyebrow. And, and I didn't realize that at the time, but I, when I watched the video and I went back and watched the video, I was like, wow, if someone accused me of killing my sister or killing, you know, anybody in my family, I would stand up and be like, uh, -uh I did not do that. Here's my, you know, like I shouldn't have to prove this, but here you go. You know, here's, here's, here's where I was. Here's this. And here's that. Um, none of that happened. So the day goes on and we hadn't received a phone call from the coroner yet. So, um, when we called, apparently he put himself, my uncle put himself as the point of contact for that coroner 
because he said that he couldn't get a hold of us, which is odd because, you know, I'm at tail end of millennial. I have the phone with me all the time, you know, like I'm on that thing. Um, so that was a little odd, but we did get that switched. Um, again, like so much circumstantial stuff that has happened. I'm trying to like recollect my thoughts here, but, um, the first thing that we did, uh, was, was go and find a a private investigator because, oh, this is why, this is why we had to do that. And this is a huge, huge thing. And I can't believe I didn't bring this up, but because the cops said that it was an accident or, or proclaimed that that's what they believed, they went back to their office and closed the case. Five hours after a woman, a 60 year old, healthy woman who has worked in construction for a whole life and has built the pond that she was found in. Five hours after she was found, they said, case closed, accident. And they never, they, I didn't find out the case was actually closed until November, until my private investigator gave me the, um, gave me the, um, police report. Because when I went, there's a police captain who, who was involved and he, his name was Toby Moro. And, um, he did not, he told me he couldn't give me the police report because the case was open. And I kept asking and asking and asking. Well, I mean, sooner or later I stopped asking. And then my private investigator that we found, he's ex FBI, his name's Bob Frederick. And he has been wonderful wonderful and he's done lots of great things for us especially in that beginning but we had a team meeting and he was on the case he brought this um this police report and i about fell off my chair because i'm like how did you get this and he said well the case is close you can go go get it and and i was enraged i mean i couldn't believe what was happening here And, and it it really felt like a dream because or a nightmare. It's just so surreal because I felt like I was screaming and like bleeding from the inside out and no one was hearing me. No one was hearing me and I was just going to be left. Honestly, the police chief saw my dad at the gas station maybe a week later and said that I was a crazy over emotional female that was trying to blame the past on somebody else and that I was targeting this, my uncle because of the things that he's done to me. And um, that's how they wanted it to be. That's how they wanted the community to see it. And a lot of people... Yes. Yeah. I begged them. Like, I was like... I, I couldn't have been like my heart was literally outside of my body and I just I, I was just desperate desperate for somebody somebody to help me and I just felt so that was definitely the lowest point in my entire life because I felt so helpless and just like there was nothing that I could do and people were calling me crazy. Um, I actually lost friends like childhood friends over this, um, because of the things that I was saying, because I, I needed people to hear me. And apparently because I was so emotional and panicked and, and enraged and traumatized, people didn't believe me. Um, but as time went on, they started to, we got our private investigator. This case was closed for seven months until they reopened it as a homicide because the coroner came back with his results and said that she was, um, she was killed by homicide and that the scene was staged and they finally reopened the case as a homicide and started looking into it seven months months later. Well, guess what? Guess who scrapped the tractor? He did. My uncle did. Of course. 
who had burn piles right where my my mom's car was of course he did oh but you know what that's okay because that's where it used to happen you know that's where the burn pile usually is well it's so convenient he stopped cutting the grass near that second pond it is now literally almost four feet high i mean it's dead because of the winter but when it's growing it's grown it is so overgrown it's never been like that my entire life so my grandma in that moment went full on dementia um and my aunt diane who is my my mom's sister was the only sibling to actually help um i mean she she really helped us fund the private investigation and uh, a lot of the things we did we got the tracker forensically um analyzed and they said that the tracker was in working condition and the tracker was actually in neutral when the tractor went into the pond we had to sub pump the pond get a crane we rented a crane we brought it up i mean we probably spent upwards of two to three hundred thousand dollars of our own money to figure this thing out things that the cops refused to do um they okay so during during that time during our private investigation time uh, we did a lot of that sort of thing um we actually um all went to get polygraph tests i mean the, the main characters you know like my dad would 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 be a suspect normal right because he's the ex-husband my mom's fiance should be a sus- suspect he's he's the new the new one the new man in her life my uncle he's right there they have a history he was right there when when it happened you know when she was there um i took one and my aunt took one out of those five people just take a guess who didn't take one he refused to take one we paid for it we had it all set up we said we'll even give you know not me but like the people that were that handled this my private investigator was going to set up a ride from everything the news came and interviewed me prior to us we had just made these appointments and we were um looking forward to like taking this and i went over to that property and showed the news around i was talking to them and of course who do you know comes over because he can see from his house somebody was over there so he kept rolling over in his big ass truck trying to intimidate well here we caught him off guard because it was the news and they were rolling they were rolling so in this moment he agreed to take a polygraph but his excuse was i shouldn't have to defend myself but my reasoning is well then just help us figure out who it is if it's not you take the polygraph get out of the way so we can go find who really killed my mom right why not my dad did it passed my my mom's fiance did it passed i did it passed my aunt did it passed I mean, come on regardless of of my history with you or or my sister's history with you we could hate each other's guts but still love my mom he didn't have to he should he the, the thing is is like because he knew that i was like pushing this that i really truly believed that it was him that you know he he felt attacked you know so he felt like if he went to do this polygraph test it was like giving in to me which no it's it's it wasn't about that it wasn't about you giving in to me or you doing this because i think you did it it's because you love your sister that's why you should do it and to prove your innocence so we could actually figure out who really killed her but he didn't do it so even though the news said there he told the news he would he did not he refused it the day of he never showed still to this day you no know, regardless of what he's telling people on the street he's never taken a polygraph test ever so in the, in the meantime we're still investigating so we're we're doing all of this work and trying to put the pieces of this puzzle together so while we're doing this my uncle decides to take my grandma to her estate attorney 
and he tries to have my mom taken out of the will. Apparently he had convinced my grandma that that's just what you do when people die. And so by taking my mom out, that would take me and my sister out. So we, we know that like, that's his main goal here is to, to, is to, to really just take over the estate. It's really not a huge estate, but for a middle-class family, pretty big. It's a lot for, for someone, for people that don't, didn't really come from money, you know? But when, when you have an old lady who is 85 years old at the time, actually, no, she was probably closer to 88. Um, she's 94 now. Oh my God. Yeah. It, it, she's, she's old. She's got dementia. And this just really put the dementia in full force, you know, easily convince her that that's just what you do. But luckily, the estate attorney was so smart and she kind of knew that these things were happening to my grandma. Like she knew like that she was kind of going a little bit. So she's, and she did realize that, you know, my, my mom had passed away. Um, and she said, no, we need to have a doctor evaluate her first. She was deemed incompetent. We had a court hearing. I mean, he fought this tooth and nail. But this is what was best for my for my grandma. And now she's in like the nicest, <laughs> the nicest nursing facility, memory care place that you can imagine. I mean, she gets her hair done there. She gets her nails done. And you know what? Good for it. Spend your money. Do it. Because that honestly, the sweetest revenge for me would be that there was nothing left. There was nothing left for him. And now it's all protected. So my grandmother, all of her bills, all of her everything, all of the rent money from her rental properties, everything goes to the estate attorney. And there, and basically there's an estate attorney and a guardian of the state. And those two people work together to make sure everything is, is nice, packaged up in a box. And because they also know after this happened, the dynamic of the family and what happened to my mom and the siblings fighting over money. Um, so, and there's opportunity because he works for himself. And the interesting part, I'm going to leave my grandfather's name out of this because they have the same name. And that made things very easy for him after my grandfather passed to take his place in, in the estate, you know? Um, so (laughs) I just, he, he had motive, he had opportunity because there, he cannot, he said he was working, but he can't remember where, can't remember what he was doing. Um, so that day that it happened, as we discovered more, my mom was going, there was a gas well on that property and they were going to the courthouse her and my grandma had an appointment at the courthouse. They were going to go file the papers to put the, um, the deed or whatever it is that they have to do in her name instead of my grandfather's name. So my uncle's wife decides it's a great day to take my grandma to lunch and to the grocery store. My uncle goes to the goes to lunch they drop him back off at home meanwhile we see on camera my mom pulls into the driveway of my grandma's house she pulls out a bunch of papers she goes in she pets the cat she unlocks the door she walks in she's in for about five minutes realizes oh no grandma she turns around goes back into her vehicle and she drives away after a lot of, I mean, I viewed this video like hundreds of times and it's hard to see through the foliage, but you can see his driveway. And I believe that we can see like a little sliver of the car going down that driveway, but we cannot necessarily prove that at this moment. But that's what I believe happened because 
grandma typically walks over there. They're right through the yards. Um, and he's the closest relative to my grandma. So where's grandma? Well, let's, let's check over here. So my mom, this is my theory with the evidence that we have found. This is my theory. My theory is that my mom goes over there. She gets upset and says, you knew I had an appointment. Where is grandma? Why did you do this? Why did you take her out to lunch into the grocery store? You know? So that's where grandma was at the moment. She was at the grocery store with the wife. And um, I believe that there was an altercation between my mom and my uncle. And I think my mom said something smart and probably infuriated him. We do know from the autopsy that she had blunt force trauma to the head. So I believe that she was hit in the back of the head and knocked out. She also, from the autopsy, had chest compression. So I believe that after she was knocked out, she was sat on or stood on or something. Um, And wouldn't you know it, there was no water in her lungs. So she had been deceased prior to going into the water. I said, I never thought that he would try to save her. I I mean, my mind just went to something else, but that could be it because I don't think, I really don't think that this was planned. I think it happened. And because of my mom said something so enraging to him, maybe, I, I don't know. I don't know what she said. Probably something about money or grandma or what he was doing or him as a person, I don't call the ambulance. I mean, and say, uh, I just did this, come get her and try to save her. I I don't know. I don't know, but I don't know. Everything that could have gone wrong here in this investigation. And in this case, it did. The laws seem to protect the offenders and not the victim. And I wish that I had the time because while we were going through this seven months and really even beyond, because I was so fully encompassed in this investigation that I, I really almost lost my mind. Like I had to, after about a year, um, I had to take a step back. I had to go to meetings and therapy and group therapy and homicide survivor groups and 12 step programs. And I mean, I, I had to, to save my own life. I had kids counted on me. They were only three and one at the time that this, that this happened Two and four really, as the time was moving on, was was like really when I was in the grips of things. But if, if nothing else comes from this podcast, but somebody else being being helped or getting some hope um in keeping my mom's story alive too but it's possible to like get over that hill and i feel like i i'm living proof of that because there are so many days where i feel like my life could have gone a lot differently but i i really did like i i I started reading books about, you know, what happens after people die or people that have died and come back. And that really comforted my soul. And I was going to therapy and then I, you know, I got psychiatrists and, you know, all of those things kind of put together really helped me. And and here I am five years later and it it took a long time, took a long time, but I would have to say about a year ago, I feel like I had really started getting a little bit more peace in my heart and acceptance and joy in my life. Um, it's so worth it. It's so hard, but it's so worth it. I feel today like I know myself better than I ever have in my entire life. And I hate to say that there's a bright side to any of this shit that happened, but I did the work to get through that. And there were so many times I wanted to give up, you know, and, and, and not, and let the rage consume me and let, you know, the sadness consume me because that's what kind of person I am. I probably would have let myself do that. 
but I had kids. Those, they, those little little monsters really saved my life because I knew I they needed me. Yeah, I think first and foremost, um, I'd be for the victim. I, I think, and I on it, and I gotta say something because this this is really true to my heart. I I don't believe I don't think of myself as a victim anymore. I I truly believe that you know I I am no longer that. But for for people that are going through this, I I truly hope that they can see some sort of light at the end of the tunnel and just keep going and trying and keep pushing because you if not that person is going to take two lives or more you know um but also i do want to i want my mom's story to stay alive because if i stop telling the story it will disappear the the investigation will will disappear and it it will no longer be even talk about I mean people you know it would just go away and and I don't want that to happen I want law enforcement to know that I'm still here and I'm still pushing for this and I still want them to do something about this and now that it's considered a homicide you can't close the case you can't speaking of law enforcement because I had a really hard time here because the captain the Captain Toby Moro, he was supposed to, he was the one on this case and he was supposed to do a lot of things. I could go down a rabbit hole in a lot of different directions. I'm going to avoid that for time purposes. But basically, um, the chief police chief mysteriously <laughs> decides to retire two months after this happens. Okay. Case is still closed. He retires and they want to put Captain Toby Moro in charge as the interim police chief and obviously, you know, elect him to be the police chief. And I had a huge problem with this because I actually had them do, like, I told them like, oh, well, this should have been done, this should have been done. He didn't do, he didn't investigate anything. He didn't even tell me the case was closed. So they ended up doing an internal investigation of Toby. He was found derelict of duty and, you know, a whole slew of things that he should have done and didn't. So here he is. He's up for chief. I go to this town hall meeting. I bring all my cronies, you know, and I, you know, and I am begging them to reconsider. Like, how can you, how can this happen? How can this happen? Somebody who, who literally destroyed this case. It's either he destroyed it or it's corruption. It's one of the two. It's neither. It's nowhere in between. And um, and I don't really know the truth. And I don't know if I ever will, whether it's corruption or whether he just is in completely incompetent. Um, but they still made him chief. They still went forward and they made him chief. Um, so my sister and I decided to sue them. And... Uh, we fought long and hard and we lost the judge dismissed it um, because they are also protected under so many laws and it is very difficult to sue law enforcement and um, but we tried I mean we we did everything that we felt that we could in our power to, to bring some justice here and um, I wouldn't I wouldn't change anything I would I would do it all over again you know but um, I think I'm at a point now in my life where I'm okay knowing that I might never get justice the way I want to in this earthly life. So we finally laid her ashes where she wanted them. We took her Aruba trip. She loved Aruba. And we scattered her ashes and it was, um, it was emotional, but it wasn't sad. And I think if she was sitting right in front of me, I would, of course I would tell her I love her and I would tell her I'm sorry that I tried, that I tried my very hardest to do everything I could. 
but I know what she would tell me. And she would just tell me to let it go and live your life. <laughs> let it go. Let it go. You know, I, I, um, I, the, the investigation for a long time took precedence over myself and my family. And I know that she wouldn't want that. She would want me to focus on my children and my own well-being, my own health, my husband and our family. And thank God for him because he's been like the rock <laughs> throughout this whole thing. And um, knocked some sense into me when I needed it, not run off and, you know, go do anything that I shouldn't do. So he, he's been tremendous and he really stepped it up. Um, but I don't know. I, I wish I could tell, I, you know, I wish I could see her babe. but you know what? I know she hears me. I know she does. I know she's here. And, um, I just hope that she's like, living it up wherever she's at, you know? And, and the one thing that really comforted me was, um, not like a pastor or, uh, you know, anyone, a minister or anything like that. It was a physicist that said energy is not created and it's not destroyed. So the energy that's within us doesn't get destroyed. It just changes form. And it really changed the way I think about things and um, the way I feel things and the way I perceive nature when a cool breeze touches my face. And I just think, like, maybe that's her, you know? And honestly, even if it's all, even if I'm completely wrong, and it's all, I'm all full of shit, you know, I'm happier. I'm more joyful believing that than not believing it. So I'm just gonna, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna believe it. Before we wrap up today's episode, just a reminder that we will be at the 2023 True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival in Austin, Texas, August 25th through 27th. Come and see us and give Courtney big hugs. You can also hug me too, but... I might pop you in the face. There will be a ton of great new people that you do not want to miss out on. It's a blast and you get to be around advocates, true crime content creators, and many different and super cool vendors. Tickets are for sale at truecrimepodcastfestival.com. Also, we will have stuff to give away, but please be sure to use code BEES, B-E-E-S, for a discount at checkout. Also, Please don't forget to join our Patreon for bonus content, such as our Not So Nefarious Criminals podcast. Each week, we have a guest and we somehow always forget that we have a guest. We talk about the lighter side of crime, such as THE Florida Man. We also talk about weird Facebook scams and the like. It's so hilarious and it's just a chill time, so that makes for a great palate cleanser. You also get to hear archived content that we chose to take off the public feed, So go join the Patreon starting at $3 a month. That's less than a cup of matcha tea from Starbucks. Shay. We have got to start taking victims and survivors seriously. We are pleading with law enforcement to do such. Fight a little harder because sometimes you don't always have to protect your own. Sometimes your own people are wrong. There's something wrong when family members are doing the investigating and the footwork to solve a crime against their family members or loved ones because those family members and survivors should be using that time to grieve properly, not doing all the work while corrupt individuals of the city's finest are sitting around and eating donuts and slapping each other on the back on a job well done. Seriously, change needs to occur. How is it that people who have certifications to look further into a crime are so willingly blind to what is actually happening when you have normals like myself and Courtney seeing things for what they actually are. And by the way, Lori Lynn was a bee. 
and Sammy Lynn is a queen bee. She's protecting her own as she should. Bees are strong, resilient, but vulnerable. We must protect the bees at all costs. For without the bees, we as humans are doomed. So be vigilant. For when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. Music used in the theme was originally recorded by Ghost Stories Incorporated, remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional background music is provided by Epidemic Sound. A Nefarious Nightmare is scripted, researched, and produced by Courtney Finner and Amanda Cronin. This podcast is a Cloud 10 podcast managed by Sim Sarna, Sahiba Krieger, and Jamie Rice of Murderish and Dirty Money Moves. You can help us grow our show by leaving us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Or you can join our Patreon for lighthearted bonus content. Thank you, and as always, be vigilant.